Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Awesome. Yeah, thanks very much for, the, uh, for slotting me in. I'm an interloper for the Materials Without Quasi-Particles uh, session, but this is uh, still it's great to be here, and uh, just forgive that the talk isn't like battle-hardened, so to speak. I mean, I know these conferences can be intense, so <laughs> just, uh, I'm going to try and give you uh, an overview of why we think charge correlations in this class of uh, Kagame based metals, which have a superconducting ground state, are, are of interest and in, in how we've been studying and as long as, as well as others to try and understand which symmetries are broken as we go through the charge density wave transition of those systems and maybe try and motivate why that's important. So first off, just uh, since this is the first uh, talk on Kagame at this conference, let me just give a quick uh, overview, right? So Kagame network is, of course, a network of corner sharing triangles. And we know sort of at the sort of single orbital type binding level, you can get this kind of cool coexistence of different uh, electronic, uh, different features in the electronic band structure. And for instance, you can have a hopping interference, which gives you a flat band effect, and many people try and explore uh, sort of topological flat bands using Kagames as a structural uh, motif. Uh, you have uh, Dirac crossings at the K point, and then at, you have a series of two saddle points which give rise to Van Hove singularities. And so, what I'll be talking to you about today is trying to find a material where one can tune the, the band filling to be at these uh, saddle point uh, features. So basically, bring the Fermi level to the saddle point and access these Van Hove singularities as an attempt to try and stabilize some unconventional electronic states. And this has been thought about for a long time. Uh, and in, in principle, you can realize a variety of different interaction-driven instabilities if you, one can tune the filling of a Kagame band structure to these uh, Van Hove points. Uh, you know, here's an example of a phase diagram uh, by Ronnie Tamale's group looking at, for instance, as a function of the on-site and uh, nearest neighbor Coulomb interaction. Um, and basically sort of tuning the ratio of these and the proximity to the Van Hove can give rise to quite a rich spectrum of electronic ground states. You can have bond density wave order, uh, different flavors of charge density wave states, spin density wave order, as well as predictions of unconventional superconductivity. Uh, and so one of the more you know, interesting sort of predictions in terms of bond density wave orders that you can have an imaginary component that gives rise to uh, like an orbital form of magnetism. So basically an imaginary CDW or a chiral charge density wave. There's lots of different pe names that people use for this. Uh, I, I'll use a word like orbital antiferromagnet. And a lot of sort of the ideas of, of, of predicting, for instance, uh, un uh, unconventional superconductivity, for instance, D plus ID as a leading instability, also mapped to lots of earlier work on other hexagonal systems. So a honeycomb lattice, for instance, this is by uh, Nankishore and uh, our chairman, uh, Andre, um, where you can realize D plus ID if you can tune towards the Van, Van Hove points. in that system, as well as uh, in, in, in thinking about these sort of flux phases, some of the original predictions by Haldane on, on a, a honeycomb lattice of, of, of graphene. OK. so. Uh, in terms of, okay, so that's the, the physical motivation. So the materials platform that we're talking about is this, this structure. So it's an alkali metal, vanadium-3 antimony-5, or people call it 135. Um, and so the, the fundamental building block is uh, this Kagame net here of, uh, of vanadium ions, okay? And each vanadium ion is coordinated by an octahedra of antimony. And so you end up with these V3 sb 5 blocks, which are then separated by these layers of alkali metal ions. Okay, so it's a quasi two-dimensional electronic structure. It's quasi two-dimensional chemically, right? It exfoliates fairly well. Um, and if you look at the density, your sort of rough cut, sort of density a functional theory model of the electronic band structure in this system, it looks like a mess, right? It's, of course, a multi-orbital system because this medium has multiple d orbitals as well as uh, there are states which come from antimony. But what I want to focus your attention on here is at the endpoint of this system, there's a series of saddle points, okay? And these derive from the, uh, the, the Kagame net, right? So the uh, vanadium states in the, in, in the structure. And you can see also, if you, if you look at the K point, you can see the Dirac point I mentioned earlier uh, is sort of a generic feature that forms out of Kagame band structures. Okay. And so these systems are sort of an interesting possible realization of a Kagame system which has been tuned to close to this Van Hove filling. Um, and indeed, so this is just uh, some angle Rosell photoemission. This is an example. There's been lots of other work done, but this is by Ricardo Homan's group, where they're looking at one variant, which is the cesium vanadium 3 antimony 5 system, OK? Um, and they're looking at the band structure, and it's sort of the k's equals pi plane. What they find is that they, uh, if you look at the endpoints of the brilliant zone, basically, you have almost perfect nesting between the endpoints, OK? 
And in fact, if they look at the band where uh, you basically the, you have this, this perfect nesting, as you cool the system down, they see this partial gap opening okay, at, at the endpoints. Okay? Um, and of course, again, there's a number of different band hope points which identified, uh, some of which are the so-called P or pure type, and the, a second which is called the M or the mixed sublattice type. Okay. So, so these systems, as I mentioned, so there seems to be something happening in the electronic structure, and indeed these systems are charge density wave superconductors. So uh, as you cool the system down, I'll just, uh, all three systems behave kind of qualitatively similarly, right? So there's a higher temperature tra tra phase transition, um, which corresponds to the onset of charge density wave order. I'll focus your attention here on these left panels, right? So this is the cesium vanadium 3 antimony 5 variant. So at high temperature, the system's a polyparamagnet. You cool down and then below uh, 94 Kelvin in the case of, of uh, the cesium-based compound, you see a drop in the density of states corresponding to the onset of charge density wave order. Um, and then if you keep cooling the system down, uh, this system becomes a superconductor below about 2.5 Kelvin. Um, uh, and so basically you get qualitatively similar behavior on the potassium and rubidium-based variants just changing out the alkali metal site. The only thing that changes is the onset temperature of the, of the transitions where potassium and rubidium have a, a TC of about, a Kel, you know, about 0.9 Kelvin or 0.8 Kelvin, uh, and they have a slightly different onset temperatures of uh, charge density wave order. Okay, but qualitatively, the systems sort of all seem to have a similar type of phase behavior. Okay, so I guess the, the focus of this talk is what symmetries are broken in this charge density wave phase as a, a way of trying to figure out maybe what what were sort of the starting uh, uh, symmetries when superconductivity forms, right? Because we want to try and understand if this is indeed an unconventional superconductor. So the first thing we need to do is understand what the charge density wave phase is doing. And so, so what's the charge density wave phase predicted to do? So if you look at just a single layer, okay, so this is a single Kagame plane of these vanadium ions, and DFT predicts that there's two energetically favored distortions. So these are all distortions which have three uh, propagation vectors or three Q distortions, and they're basically two different flavors of a breathing mode of this Kagame lattice. So the first flavor is a so-called Star of David distortion, where it breathes in one direction and you end up with this uh, pattern of a Star of David with the longer bond lengths between the Star of David uh, uh, units. And uh, that corresponds to um, uh, three Q vectors with uh, magnitude to the M point in the brilliant zone. So that's so-called um, MMM type distortion, but with one of the phases running opposite to the other two. Okay, but if you run the phase of all three in the same sense, then you get the so-called trihexagonal distortion, which is also predicted to be energetically favored, where this, uh, the Kagame net breathes into these hexagons and triangles. Okay, and of course the system is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a layered material, but you can have interactions between the planes, and so one can also think about uh, momentum uh, momentum points with a finite L component or a finite uh, KZ component, like the L uh, position of the brilliant zone. So you, one can then think about a way of realizing a three-dimensional charge density wave state, either by, for instance, staggering uh, the relative phasing of one plane relative to the next, for instance, of a given distortion type, or, for, for, in, for instance, modulating the distortion types along the C-axis. So, okay. So as it turns out, when you, when you just solve the... Uh, Crystal, the crystal structure below the charge density wave transition for these three systems, uh, they kind of break up into two different classes. The rubidium and potassium variants, this is the, you know, in the terms of the real space structure, the primary distortion is these guys form a, a supercell which doubles in the AB plane and then doubles along the C axis. And both of these correspond to a staggered trihexagonal distortion. So a given Kagame plane is breaking up into these triangles and hexagons, and then one plane relative to the next is sliding half a unit cell. Okay, so that gives it an orthrhombic symmetry, so FMMM. So you, the charge density wave state lowers the rotational symmetry from sixfold to twofold. Okay, so that's the symmetry that's broken. Um, a distinction is the cesium system seems to realize. Uh, a, on, when, when looking at the average structure, a slightly larger supercell along the C-axis, and sort of the refinement of the crystal structure seems to uh, favor a mixture of both star of David and trihexagonal distortion. So it's a bit more complicated, right? So it's not just one distortion type in a plane, it's instead you have sort of an, uh, a modulation of these two different distortion types along a larger supercell. Okay, and there's some details with this. If anybody has questions later, I can't go into all of them in 20 minutes. 
Um, OK, so that's the real, real part, and that's easy to determine, right? And so but the idea, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that if you can tune a Kagame system to these Van Hove points, that you can also potentially realize this sort of orbital antiferromagnetic phase. And so there's a variety of so-called flux phases that are predicted in these systems. Um, and one can envision, basically, uh, the charge density wave state as having both a primary or, or, and or secondary order parameter. And either of these can be either real or imaginary. Okay? So it's an, the idea is there are predictions that you can have these different patterns of orbital antiferromagnetism potentially uh, accompanying the onset of this real uh, charge density wave state, this distortion I showed you. Um, so if I were just to give you a summary, right? So you have some starting Kagame net. Uh, you can think about two different pathways where you have a uh, 3q order, okay? So for the real component of the charge density wave state, that can breathe a given layer into either the trihexagonal or star of David distortion types. And then you can add, potentially ha also have encoded an imaginary component of this, which gives you uh, uh, this sort of uh, orbital antiferromagnetic phase. And then, of course, these are layered materials, so you can also have some L-axis or KZ component that causes a modulation between layers. And so in reality, for the real space, picture are, are for these variants, the potassium and rubidium 135 systems, you get this staggered trihexagonal distortion, whereas the cesium system, you get a larger unit cell that seems it's a, basically a combination of this staggered trihexagonal plus this modulation between uh, trihexagonal and star of David, okay? So that's a, a detail, but just to show you that the cesium one is a bit more complicated in terms of the real space structure. Okay. Okay, so then why, why do we keep talking about the orbital a magnetism of the system. So the reason that, that this thought that may be germane for this particular material is there's a series of experiments which have claimed to see signatures of uh, broken time reversal below the onset of the charge density wave state. Okay? Um, and I, I would say so the first sort of report of this or is STM studies where they look on the surface of the system so they can see super lattice peaks uh, you know, in their tunneling spectra spectrum, uh, which corresponds to the two by two reconstruction of the unit cell in the charge density wave phase. When they look at the Fourier weight of these uh, super lattice peaks at the three inequivalent endpoints, they can find that there's some winding they can ascribe to it, okay? So, for instance, if you look in this direction, you go from high to low. Uh, but then what they find is that they flip the direction of a magnetic field, uh, this is from Zahita Sans group, that they can flip this winding, okay? So I guess at the, the coarsest level, they seem to have a charge density wave order parameter that's coupling to a, a magnetic field, suggesting that the charge density wave phase itself breaks time reversal, okay? So this has been, this phenomenology has been reported in all three variants, but it was all by the same group, okay? Uh, another sort of signature is in, in muon spin relaxation studies. This is on the potassium system, but again, it's sort of generic. It's a similar behavior seen in all three systems, is as you cool the system down, the muon spectrum basically sees uh, an uptick in the relaxation rate that the muons see, potentially corresponding to some disordered static magnetism or an enhanced in, uh, spin fluctuations. Um, and they find that that turns on below the charge density wave phase and it couples to the, uh, it's enhanced under the application of a magnetic field. Um, there's a number of different uh, transport studies. For instance, uh, Philip Moll's group has done some a switchable chiral transport looking at uh, higher harmonics in the transport. This experiment I can't explain very well. He's here, though. You can ask it. <laughs> um, uh, there's also a large anomalous Hall effect that turns on below the uh, charge density wave phase, uh, also seen in magnetotransport studies. Um, there's scanning circular dichroism measurements, which claim to see different subdomains of different sign of circular dichroism below the charge density wave uh, transition in all three systems. Uh, there's recent torque magnetometry measurements, which claims to see a slightly higher temperature onset of a torque signal turning on the, in the cesium-based system as you cool down. And I'll just highlight here, also, MUSR sees something strange. This is in the rubidium system. And what they claim is similar to this is in the potassium system. They also see this uptick in the uh, relaxation rate as you cool below the CDW. But in this system, if you apply pressure, you can suppress the charge density wave phase. But and, and superconductivity is enhanced. And so what they see in that case is that when they look out at high pressure, where there's no CDW, they actually see an up, this uptick in the relaxation rate occur below TC. Okay, so they, the claim there is that time reversal is somehow broken below the uh, superconducting transition. In Could these I systems. ask you a question? Yeah, please because, do. Because uh, whenever I hear time reversal symmetry breaking claimed in some material, I get very nervous. Hmm. Okay, because, okay. Because it's one of those things that Every time it has been claimed, 
either it's uh, not seen or then it goes away. So has anybody done a optical experiment, car effect, and sees? That's right. the only thing that will convince me at any level. All these others are great. Right. But so I'm, okay. So this know, is my next, I mean, my next slide I'm not here. Convinced. All right. Okay. So there's issues with these, and so you'll be happy to see that uh, if you're not convinced. You're going to remain not convinced, I suppose, because this is a so Aaron's oh, this is group. Okay, I remain unconvinced. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So yes. So there's some skepticism, right? So there's also issues with this, right? And so, okay, I'll, I'll address the first point. So the polar curve effect. This is from uh, Aaron Kapletunik's group. Oh, it's Aaron's work. You should have told me that. I might. <laughs> well, okay. You don't know what you're saying at this point. This is like he doesn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so you, okay, you're on board. All right, excellent. All right, so, um, mu SR studies. Um, the issue here with the mu SR, for, for people who aren't in the muon world, is that the signal that they're seeing is weak. Okay, so it corresponds really, like the or, an original study basically is called absence of local moments in this system, in these systems, because the depolarization rate can be ascribed to just coming from um, the nuclear fields, the fields uh, on, this, on the order of the nuclear moments, okay? Um, STM studies, uh, there's some controversy in that the effects that was reported, for instance, on the, on the potassium system could, were not repeated by another group, okay? So this was some, uh, some systematic error versus uh, surface preparation debate in the community. Um, you know, the magne magnetochiral transport studies can be interpreted a number of different ways. It could be structurally chiral, for instance. Uh, in the anomalous Hall effect, there's no spontaneous Hall component, which uh, is also makes it more difficult to try and understand what's going on. Um, so, okay. So, it's, it's not uh, ironclad. Yeah. No, I want to ask more about this polar curve effect uh, result. Uh, I know it's Aaron's work, but... Uh, you know what's the takeaway from this? Is it that the uh, training effect is missing, or is there a total lack of signals? Because if I squint my eyes, I can kind of see that below the dash line there is some uh, weakage signal. Can you see the numbers? Yeah. Okay, so the weak of, of the scattered is the same as the nanorating. Yeah. So I think this conclusively rules out any Q is equal to zero magnetic component, right? Mm -hmm. So well, actually, Andre and I earlier had a work coming from uh, a real CDW and the imaginary CDW, and they, as a combination, it does give you a zero. Okay, sure. Okay, I'm happy to chat just with you more. Sure. Okay, so I think this is fairly strong evidence that you know uh, that, that there's no Q is equal to zero magnetism in these systems. Okay, so. Um, the question is like whether well, there's a finite Q component um, and that somehow STM is coupling into or these other, I mean, uh, mu SR, of course, would couple into that. Um, and so there's some recent work by uh, Vidya Madhavan's group, which I think is kind of finally pushing the field forward in terms of this controversy with STM now, right? So basically she's looking at the rubidium system and she can reproduce the original stuff that was done by Zahida San's group, okay? So she can see this surface chirality in the CDW between the three different endpoints. She can apply a magnetic field and flip the direction, okay? So that's a zeroth order thing, okay? So we have a tiebreaker in that. That's good. Uh, but then she further finds that you can actually switch this chirality also with the application of a linear electric field just via light. Okay, she's applying linear, pol uh, linearly polarized light. Um, and so the idea is that um, this, this is work with Rafael Fernandez, so you guys can direct <laughs> questions to him, is that this comes from a piezomagnetic response, okay, which is the, basically doing the a symmetry analysis. It would mean that there would be t broken time reversal uh, in the system, but that strain, sample strain, can have a very large effect in terms of activating, for instance, a Q is equal to zero component, okay, which might explain some of the discrepancies between the various optical groups, right? For instance, why, why is circular dichroism seen here, but there's no polar curve effect here? So just trying to understand this. Um, uh, maybe there's a, a strong influence of sample strain. So, okay, we've tried looking into this. This is just a, this is a, a technique called dark field X-ray mic microscopy. You can look at sample crystallographic texture, strain texture, just by like blasting X-rays through a sample and then looking at, using an X-ray microscope. 
And indeed, this, uh, the only takeaway here is I just want to show you, you know, you can see this is an intensity map of the illuminated area of the sample. You can see that it's not homogeneous. You can see this light parts, right? These are parts of the sample where you have stronger strain, and you can see that this kind of migrates around as you cool below the CDW. So strain, yeah? I just want to make the point that circular cycles cannot distinguish equal Correct. It's the only measurement, optical measurement that can do it. Okay, great. All right. Good. So, uh, so right now, sort of hypothesis is that one has to be very careful with strain, and then this can indeed. Okay. One minute left. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, okay. I'll take two. I'm going to go fast. All right. So. Another thing that I want to highlight in these systems is you cool down from the charge density wave state down to the superconducting phase, depending on the material, but I'm going to focus on what is arguably the cleanest material, cesium vanadium 3 antimony 5 which has the largest residual resistivity ratio. There seems to be two intermediate temperature scales that happen on the way to superconductivity. One is, a is around 60 Kelvin or so, and it's a temperature scale which I sit is uh, lattice anomalies are detected via Raman, um, as well as time-resolved um, optical reflectivity. Um, measurements, uh, and probably most dramatically in STM measurements where they see the onset of these quasi-one-dimensional stripes at the surface of the system below this temperature scale. Okay, so then as you continue cooling, there seems to be another intermediate scale around 32 Kelvin where, or 35 Kelvin, where there's claims of rotational symmetry breaking in the electronic properties. So for instance, pneumatic elastoresistance measurements, uh, sort of quasi-particle interference patterns seem to see the onset of coherent one-dimensional quasi-particles in the system. So there seems to be a staged evolution as you cool, and one thing we wanted to do is see are there signatures of structural rotational symmetry breaking uh, as we cool below the system. And the, the, um, the idea is that maybe there's some nearby competing instability, so we can perhaps destabilize the parent charge density wave order and see what happens. And so one way of doing that is we can dope the system. Okay, these aren't very large levels of doping. This is 5% holes per formula unit and you suppress the thermodynamic anomaly associated with the charge density wave order, okay? But you get this sort of strange pattern in superconductivity, right? So CDW comes down, and you sort of get two domes of, super, of superconducting phase behavior. Um, we can do X-ray scattering, and we can look at how the charge correlations evolve as you walk across this phase diagram, okay? So looking here, this is, uh, this is at the peak of the first dome where there's charge density wave order, so you get these, two, these uh, super lattice peaks. These correspond to two by two order. If you look at the dip here, okay, then these peaks become incommensurate quasi-one-dimensional charge correlations, okay, as you're starting to, as you're basically transitioning from this dome to this dome, okay. Um, so basically you have quasi-1D correlations that we can be parameterized basically as antiphase correlations between the planes with an incommensurate propagation wave vector and uh, a correlation length that is extended sort of perpendicular to the stripe, okay, if you're going to use a stripe type picture for this. Okay, so then one can, one point I want to stress here is that you can look at that same sample with these quasi-one-dimensional incommensurate charge modulations in X-rays, and you can look at, again, in, in STM measurements. This is by Ilya Zeltovich's group. And what they see is when they look at the surface, the two-by-two two order is absent, as one would expect. But instead, what they see are these sort of stripe-like features uh, with a slightly different incommensurability than what we see. Well, okay, it's actually 0.1 off, right? So something is clearly modifying them at the surface, but these are the only charge correlations that STM sees, okay? So it's in contrast to what they see in the parent compound, where they see these well-defined uh, stripes turn on on top of the two by two in the in the undoped system. Um, okay, so we can continue doping. We can look, can look at the peak of the second dome. Okay, and when we do that, the charge correlations basically it seems like translational symmetry is restored, and you end up with just these uh, kind of diffuse quasi one D stripes. I kind of show you a pattern here. It doesn't show very well here. Um, since I'm running out of time, this is just a different picture of them. One can model this as three quasi-one-dimensional domains with anti-phase stacking. One minute left now, for real. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then if we keep doping out here, this is now a partial volume fraction superconductor. Uh, TC is almost vanished. There's no charge correlations left. Okay. So there's a rather complicated evolution of charge correlations as you dope across this uh, phase diagram. And here's just the summary. You go from this two by two to this quasi-one-dimensional incommensurate phase. Translational symmetry is restored here, but rotational symmetry is still broken by the charge correlations in that dome. All right, so I'll just summarize. We think these are interesting class of, uh, of charge density wave superconductors. They have a filling near the Van Hoes uh, points. 
And there's hints of time reversal symmetry breaking, but there's also this interesting staging of intermediate correlations that happen as you cool in the parent system, which can then be stabilized to static behavior once you dope the system, for instance, or apply pressure. And we think unintentional strain plays a large role in sort of the experimental discrepancies in the system. They're very soft materials, so sample preparation is important. And yeah, I'll just, I'll leave there. And thank you very much for your attention. These are the people who did the work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Some time for questions. Yeah, I can, oh yeah. So, do you have a proper understanding of why TC is higher, the superconducting TC in the cesium compound? Is it because of the CDW? Is it because the samples are cleaner? Is it a pressure effect? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say no. Empirically, when you, empirically when you, when you suppress the CDW, TC goes up uh, with doping to the, in the cesium system up to about four Kelvin. I mean, you get something similar in the other two systems as well, once you suppress the CDW. So it might be this, yeah, maybe the competition between the two. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not, I don't think that's understood. Yes or no? Yeah, and just on the last part, just to clarify. So how does the, the one-dimensional CDW order evolve out of that two-by-two two reconstructed uh, thing? Does, does the wave vector, the wavelength change uh, with doping as you move out? Yeah, sorry, that's what I had to really fly through. <laughs> um, let me just, here's the, I'll just do the picture here. Okay, so this, this is the two by two peak, okay? And so basically you get incommensurate charge correlations right at the suppression of the thermodynamic anomaly associated with this. So it only appears there, it doesn't only evolve appears. out. It doesn't and, evolve out. And then, and so we don't have a doping dependence about this, right? I Between see. here and okay. here, we don't have a reliable I doping see. dependence. Okay. And then in the second dome, it, Translational symmetry seems to be restored, and you, but you still have these rotational symmetries. Got it. Great. Thank you. Since you are on this plot, is there any information about what kind of superconductivity you have in the two domes? Yeah. So, I mean, so that's kind. It's kind of why I showed the MUSR data. Yeah. So it's not very well understood. So, I think the original. There was some very nice work uh, doing ir irradiation measurements, right, where they claimed that everything should be explained with S++, no sign change. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been some recent theoretical work by, I think, Brian Anderson's group claiming that uh, for the Kagame lattice, there's something special when it's at this P-type Van Hove that, uh, that uh, the D plus ID, for instance, is just as robust as S-wave. But uh, you expect that the pairing symmetry is the same on both sides of the uh, cusp? Yeah, I think they see it go from something that's uh, more more anisotropic to something more isotropic here, but no major differences. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think there's nothing that really shows a major difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I have a very quick comment on the uh, complex CGW in this uh, system. So uh, uh, th this is from a point of view of weak coupling reorganization group analysis. So normally, if you uh, take the system like graphene, uh, you will get uh, and dope the system to the Van Hoff singularity you get D plus ID. And there are also other competing orders that are subleading. And there are two possibilities to get the complex CDW uh, from this uh, RG analysis. The first example is to extend the fermion flavor from two to like four. So this is an example you can get complex CDW. And the other example is to invoke this uh, sublattice interference. For example, you dope the system to the P-type uh, Van Hoff singularity. Then for this, uh, uh, you run the same RG equation, you, get, you will find the complex CDW as the leading. No need for Ginsberg analysis. So they have a recent paper on this with uh, Roni Tamani and uh, Sri Raku. So okay. yeah, we may check later. Yeah, thank you. Rafael? Uh, is, is actually just uh, another quick comment. And based on the discussion that happened during the talk about time reverses, just to make a point that you, you made in passing that we need to distinguish when, what we mean by time reversal. If you just mean time reversal symmetry breaking, it does not imply that you have a finite magnetic moment. So for example, the experiments that you mentioned of the, of the uh, uh, flipping the order of the CDWs with magnetic field would, ne would not give you a magnetic moment, would give you zero curve, but I would still call that time reversal symmetry breaking. So I think 
uh, those are just to make sure, just make the comment that those are different things. Yeah, right, absolutely. Very good question. So uh, when you do the system, how, what happens with the RRR ratio, how much more dirty the system becomes and how much effects of impurities you actually see? Um, yeah, the triple R goes up when you dope it. How dramatically, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, TC sharpens, strangely, uh, but uh, TC oh, sharpens nice. in resistance. Uh, and, um, but yeah, the, it, definitely the residual resistance goes up. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, give the last one. Uh, you raised the appetite on time reversal symmetry breaking. Any, any data on, uh, in the superconducting state? that says something about DRS. Yeah, I mean, so that's why, yeah, that's tried, why I tried to highlight the USR data from uh, Zurab here, which is kind of strange, right? So basically, when they see this uptick in depolarization rate in, in the na native system, you know, they, they, the claim is basically time reversal is broken here, so they don't see any real change as they go down here. They see some subtle changes in the inflection, but when they apply pressure and they suppress it, they suppress the charge density wave state, then they only see this uptick below TC. So that's kind of interesting. I don't, I don't know an explanation for that, but except. Okay, on this, thanks very much. Thank you.